my favorite part. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, uh, the place where you are in the know. Uh, good evening, I'm Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, uh, and proud to be the chair for uh, tonight's program, uh, a very exciting one. Uh, this program is supported by the Bay Area Elites Fund of the San Francisco Foundation, uh, and is part of the foundation's series on people, place, and power, addressing access and equity in the Bay Area. Today's program is titled, The Hope of Our Future, uh, Youth Leaders in Their Own Words. Um, and as I said, we are very excited. Um, the recent march of our lives nationwide protests against gun violence led by teenage survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting were some of the largest youth protests and demonstrations since the Vietnam War. Uh, but as we know, uh, young people uh, in this country have uh, ushered uh, social change uh, movements from civil rights uh, to Black Lives Matter to the Vietnam War uh, undocumented uh, children at the border and unaccompanied minors, just you name it, uh, young people have been uh, at the forefront of producing uh, change. Uh, there are 22 million American teens that will turn 18 by the 2020 election. Uh, and it sounds like the, the folks in this room are hopeful that they will be bringing uh, a kind of uh, exuberance to the election that will really make a difference, uh, giving young people tremendous political power at a critical moment in our uh, country's history. Uh, what will the future look like under their leadership? Uh, tonight, some of the Bay Area's brightest uh, leaders will discuss issues that they care about, uh, the policies that they're working to change, the tools and strategies that they're using to grow their movements. Uh, when we create space for young people, support their advocacy, listen to their voices, uh, you will see that they speak truth to power. Before I introduce the entire panel and the discussion begins, I wanna first introduce Caitlin Clark. She is an 18-year-old poet uh, and high school senior graduating uh, who uh, represented the Bay Area at the Brave New Voices International Poetry Festival in 2014. Uh, she became the youngest person ever to earn the title of the Teen Poetry Slam champion at age 14. <laughs> Caitlin has performed alongside John Legend and Sharon Jones, and her work has been published in the Bay Area Youth Anthology and Straight Up. When not working as a poet, mentor with uh, You Speaks, she is busy running the Intersectional Gender Equity and Feminism Club. She started in her junior year, uh, and she will be attending Yale University this fall. <laughs> to present one of her poems to us, please welcome Caitlin. One, should they ever come for us next and our last breath become bullet wound, tell them we did not want clear backpacks, that we did not want metal detectors or less doors or more police, we did not want thoughts and prayers, tell them we wanted to be alive, tell them we wanted to see a country where the only thing we open carry is our textbooks and our greatest weapon is our voices, too. A doctor, who treated victims of the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School described the exit wounds as as large as an orange. And watch how our bodies can turn a graveyard into a garden. How from beneath the soil we become the plants, become the flowers and the rain and the sunlight and then the sun itself, how we bear fruit in a country that loves us less than a loaded gun. There is a Mexican proverb that says they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. And there have been almost as many mass shootings in the United States this year as there have been days. An orange tree grown from seed takes approximately 15 years to blossom. And after an entire generation grows up in the shadows of school shootings, when active shooter drills are as normal and as frequent as math tests, what's shocking about the Never Again movement is not that it's happening, but that it took so long for us to start. Three, a columbine is a bell-shaped pastel flower. The word Columbine comes from the Latin word for dove, a way to make peace in a country that tears itself to pieces for. The NRA, 
describes itself as America's oldest civil rights organization. It was formed in 1871, the same year Congress passed the Ku Klux Act, a piece of legislation intended to suppress the KKK. On July 6, 2016, Philando Castile was murdered by a police officer in St. Paul, Minnesota, after informing the officer he had a firearm in the car. The NRA did not say anything in response. Instead, they chose to make martyrs of murderers until it was a record that skipped for every year I am old enough to remember, called them mentally ill until we asked for better mental health care, told us to be silent, told us to be silent, told us to be three. An evolutionary study on Columbine showed the way their sizes can vary based solely on a change in a single cell shape. Quote, this suggests that a simple microscopic change can result in a dramatic morphological variation. It is by empirical analysis and scientific method, therefore, that we can assume a voice. A simple microscopic change in a field of columbines could result in a morphological variation significant enough to create a country that refuses to watch children die in their own school, and that's Tuesday, 17. Should they ever come for us next and bring our bodies back to the soil from which we came, tell them we are a forest fire. Tell them we will burn the gardens and build new ones over and over and over again until we can live in a world without gun violence. Tell them we are here, breathing, alive, still. Just a little taste of what you're in for. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce the rest of the panelists, and I'll be going, I guess, to my right all the way down. Uh, the first is uh, Gabriel Cabrera. Uh, Gabriel is a, yes, give it up. <laughs> Gabriel is a 16-year-old junior at Arise uh, High School. Uh, since his freshman year, he has been a participant in Casa Che's after-school programs working on issues, uh, including lobbying the city of Oakland to ban uh, flavored tobacco products. Uh, in April, he spoke on the radio as part of KQED's Youth Takeover Week about the challenges of having depression and living as an undocumented immigrant. Gabriel identifies as transgender, and this year he participated in violence prevention uh, against the LGBT community. Uh, and train students and staff members at his high school on how to be allies of trans and queer students. Welcome, Gabriel. <laughs> Next is Kier Garrett. He is a 16-year-old uh, at City Arts and Tech High School. He's a longtime resident of Hunter's View neighborhood of San Francisco and has worked in the mayor's office as a Phoenix champion of Hope SF, the mixed income community in District 10. Following in his footsteps, his grandmother, Lottie Titus, who's here. Uh, Kiera is a community activist uh, who does work on community development and violence prevention. He also loves playing basketball and sees the sport as a good way to bring people together across differences. Welcome, Kier. Diane Gonzalez is next, uh, an 18-year-old freshman at City College of San Francisco. She is a youth organizer at Californians for Justice, a student-led grassroots organization working for racial justice, and a teaching assistant at Youth Beat, a media training center in Oakland focused on disadvantaged Bay Area students. She is a mental health advocate with a special focus on youth of color, and she has worked to reduce suspension rates of uh, students at Oakland High School. Uh, Cheyenne hopes to transfer to UCLA in two years. Yeah. Welcome, Cheyenne. <laughs> Last but not least, our moderator for today, uh, tonight, Hila, Hila Merriam. Okay. Yeah? All right. <laughs> Is a production coordinator at Baycat. Uh, a digital media nonprofit that has done wonderful work uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, Sinead is a passionate storyteller uh, who joined the media industry with one goal, 
to help bring more diversity to the stories we tell. At Baycat, tonight helps community organizations, small businesses, and local agencies tell their stories. Uh, she earned a BA in broadcast and electronic communication arts from San Francisco State University. Welcome her. And I now turn it over to her. Thank you, Fred. Um, good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to, and to be moderating this important um, and timely conversation. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Caitlin, wow. Yeah. Wow, right? <laughs> thank you for that important, that very important and powerful performance. Can you take us back to writing that piece? What were you responding to and what's your process? Um, so I live in a pretty small town. I live in Benicia, um, which is up by Vallejo, and um, it, it's a pretty small town. We have one high school, and in, after um, the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, a lot of the students at my high school kind of started coming together to see what we could do as a community to um, combat gun violence. And sometimes, like, being from a small town and also living in California where you think, like, your vote doesn't matter because it'll always, votes will always go one way or um, policy in our state will always go a certain way. Um, sometimes it can be easy to remain silent. Um, and I, but I think that was the problem that we were trying to address was that complacency had settled in in the issue around gun violence and particularly around school shootings that um, us and our peers had become so desensitized to school shootings and I think that's something that a lot of um, my peers can relate to. So we were trying to think of ways that we could come together as a community to call attention to this national movement that was happening. Um, and we organized uh, march for Our Lives in our town, and it was the first time that there had ever been like a march or protest that happened in our town at all. Um, and it was, there were so many people came from so many different age groups, and it was really amazing to see the power that student organizers had and that we really could make something happen. I think it's so easy for, for young people to get caught in this like bureaucracy of like, I can't do this, or I'll have to do this and this and this. Um, but once we really decided that like we were passionate about this and this is something that we didn't want to just sit around and watch happen to, to us anymore. Um, I think it, it was really powerful to see our community come together like that. Yeah. Thank you. And you've been writing spoken words since you were 14, so about um, four years now. Um, how were you introduced to this world? Um, the internet. <laughs> I wish I had like a cool story about like, <laughs> but um, no, it was really just stumbling across a button poetry YouTube video that someone had posted the link to on Tumblr, I think when I was like 14. Um, and yeah, I think t Tumblr had uh, provided a lot of access to social justice spaces that I hadn't encountered before. So this is a very interesting entry point to a completely different world that I hadn't even considered. Um, so I started kind of, um, yeah, interacting with um, social justice work and slam poetry too through, through the internet first. And then I started working with You Speaks when I was 14. And if for those of you that may not know, Tumblr is a blogging website. And Gabriel, I see you're shaking your head. Maybe you have your own Tumblr experiences. I know that you, Gabriel, you started, uh, things started changing for you when you looked up the word transgender online. Uh, first, can you explain maybe this audience, uh, just in case, um, what does transgender mean? Um, and why, what led you to looking up that word in the first place? Sure. Um, so transgender has its own meaning to transgender youth and people in general. But the overall sort of agreed definition is that you no longer identify as the gender that you were assigned at birth, um, which is like, if you were born with a certain genitalia, your gender was defined by that. And being transgender, you are no longer that gender. Um, and the reason that I looked up the word in the first place was I always had this discomfort with the word female, with being called a girl, with things that were associated with being feminine, and I never understood why. Um, 
and it, it caused a lot of like just general discomfort, um, you know, in my house, at school, having to go to a certain bathroom when I just had to pee. Um, and in middle school, when we had our, like a GSA finally established, I didn't know what GSA stood for, but I knew that they were, they had posters where they were advocating for the LGBT community, and I knew what LGB st stood for, but what the heck was the T? <laughs> and so I searched it up, and the definition that I read made sense. It sort of clicked something in my head, like, this is what I've been feeling. And since then, it's just kind of been uphill. I don't feel as much discomfort anymore. Life is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing us to learn um, with, with your experience. And as you continue to learn about your identity, um, have, you found that you're, uh, have you found it hard for your friends and family, your loved ones, um, to challenge their ideas of gender norms with you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I grew up in a very traditional household. Um, the woman would stay at home, take care of the kids, the dad would go out to work, come back super late, and go to sleep. Um, and that was just sort of the norm w that they had accepted. And me coming out, even before that, just me not liking pink was something so foreign to them. Um, and so when I did come out, it was so strange to them. They didn't know how to react. Their very first reaction really was to try and fix me because that was what they knew. And I don't hold it against them anymore because I understand where they came from. But I, I can't deny that it did hurt, um, that the people that I thought would support me didn't. And it took a lot of learning on their part and a lot of teaching for mine that I was not used to at all. <laughs> and they've come to terms with it. They understand a little better than they used to. They're not quite there yet, but they're getting there. And I appreciate the effort that they're doing. And you, you shared with me earlier um, a, a bit of your experience um, that kind of became the turning point for your family. Um, when did things change? Mm -hmm. So, this is a little heavy. <laughs> but um, when things started changing was around last year, about this time, when I had hit an all-time low. Um, I had severe depression. I didn't find any of my hobbies interesting anymore. I didn't want to get out of my house. I slept most of summer. And for most of the summer, too, I planned my suicide. I didn't want to live anymore. I thought that the way that I was living now wasn't worth it. And when I had planned to overdose on my parents' pills, and I had told my parents, I'm going to kill myself, they, that was when they realized, like, we need to stop and we need to listen to our child because if we don't, we're going to lose them. And living your life out loud has changed um, a lot of things. What do you think is the biggest um, benefit of walking in your truth? I get to teach you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, um, because I don't want someone else to have to go through what I did. I don't want someone to sleep their summer away, to not have fun, and to feel like life just isn't worth it. Because I can tell you, that sucks. It is a horrible feeling, and I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And being able to teach people is so amazing, because I can prevent one person's suicide at least one person. And if I can teach you guys, and teach more than you guys, teach my school, teach my community, my neighborhood, the rest of my family, there, there are gonna be kids like me that are alive and happy. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> nice. <I'm> so <laughs> Gabriel, thank you so much for being our teacher and for living in your truth um, and living out loud. Now, going back to one of the things that, Caitlin, you brought up, um, the internet 
is, I don't even know if you know life before it. Um, so the inter you know, you all are on the internet. So um, how, um, how much of your activism is influenced by the internet? And this question is for everybody. Um, I'll go. Uh, I feel like it has a big, imp it has a, a big impact on youth nowadays. Everything we look at or do, we look to the internet. Um, I was inspired by an artist, his name is Joner Lucas, and he has a video called I'm Not a Racist and I'm Sorry. And in these in the video, I'm Not a Racist, he's connecting, he's an African-American male, two people sitting there, and they're basically having a conversation. And what they're basically talking about is both of them have went through trauma. Obviously, the African-American male, then the white male has been through more trauma because you know of history and what we have to go through on a day-to-day -day base. So I feel like that video really touched me because it opened my eyes that if we come together and connect, we can do so many things instead of bickering and fighting with each other. We already know how to hate each other. We already know what pain feel like. I wonder what it look like if we love each other, mm -hmm. if we go out and help people. I feel like we wouldn't have some of the problems that we do now if we would do that. Because like I said, history shows that we dislike each other. We hate each other. We already seen we can fight each other, right? Crowd? Okay, thank you. So, so uh, yeah, I just feel like that if we was to come together, we could accomplish so many things instead of destroying things that we have destroyed. And Caitlin, how, how do you feel that, um, what, what kind of things have you learned online? Um, so I think, Having, I think the internet is a really, really important tool for young people and people who don't always have access to like literary texts that I think a lot of the time social justice spaces and um, like, yeah, social justice spaces I think have been confined to academia a lot of the times um, and that sometimes people will think when you say something like intersectional feminism or environmental racism, they'll immediately get turned off because they'll be like, I don't know what those words mean when you put them together like that. And I think, um, I think that's so counterproductive to a movement is if people can't, if you can't hold a conversation with someone about how you want to build a more productive future without like requiring that they've read this stack of Marxist theory, like you won't be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So I think having the internet as a tool for folks, especially low income folks who don't have access to paying hundreds of dollars for a huge textbook, then I think the internet is such an essential tool for building a movement. Um, and I think it can also be an essential tool for um, connecting people too. Um, so in my, my senior year of high school, I used my intersectional gender equity and feminism club, longest name ever, um, <laughs> <laughs> to um, petition for my high school's first all gender bathroom. Um, and we collected signatures for the petition via Twitter because we weren't going to go around school canvassing every single person to sign this pe arbitrary piece of paper when we could just post a single tweet and say, favorite this tweet if you're in support of putting your name on this petition. And we got over 100 signatures and we were able to accomplish our goal and get our school's first all gender bathroom. Um, and I think that was something that probably would not have been, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, probably wouldn't have been possible without using social media. And Cheyenne, a common criticism we hear is that the new generation of activists um, is that they're simply online activists and that they're not working to create change in the real world. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I personally strongly disagree, because I remember having ruining a lot of shirts with a lot of sweat stains, being outside and protesting with, in the real world, so I don't think that's correct. Um, <laughs> no, I think that, like my fellow panelists said, media is really big in society today and within this generation, and I believe that in every generation, there is always something. So for our generation, it happens to be media, and this is where all of our peers are going to be. And I think that it's important for us to take the platforms that we're given and use that to make sure that we're educating people who, like Kaylin said, might not be able to buy a $100 textbook or who might not be able to go outside and protest because they have to you know, work for their family to put food on the table. So a 30-second video about 
you know, youth activism or racial injustice in education, things like that, uh, young youth of color will have the ability to really understand and relate more to what activism is. And with this newer generation of activism, there seems to be a bit of a divide between older generations and newer generations um, in some spaces. So this audience question, what issues are older adults neglecting? And that's for anybody. <laughs> We're about to call some people out. <laughs> um, I think I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like being a little bit more probably understanding. Uh, as youth, me growing up, I always had my grandmother. Hi, Granny. I love you. Aww. So I always had my grandmother by my side, and I feel like she understands me a lot. And I'm noticing now a lot of people that I grew up with and I'm around don't have a grandmother who's, you know, always on you, like, clean your room, do this and that, you know, rawr, at you all the time. <laughs> so a lot of youth don't have that, and they're not really connected to their Family, they're not really connected to their family members at all. They do their daily routine. They go to school. They come home. They'll probably come home and not even say what's up to their mom or dad. And I feel like youth, you have to have a bond with your child. You have to know what they're doing. If that means getting their business, you got to do that because you don't know what they could be doing. They think, oh, mom or dad or grandma's not on my back. You know, I can do whatever I please. Am I am I live with my granny? That's not the case. It's not going <laughs> to happen. So I just feel like when you build that relationship, like I'm here for you. Like, you know, you can you can talk to me because as youth, and I even do it sometimes, You we hold a lot of stuff in because, you know, we feel like we'll be judged or, or unwanted. So I just think that we should have a better connection with one, with one another, and this is what you see a lot in the communities. You see a lot of disconnect between people. They think that they have a lot more differences than similarities, when really we, gotta, we all have a bunch of things that we can relate on, whether that's things that we've been through, whether things that we've seen, we all relate on something. We're not all different from each other. So I just think connecting a little bit more. Yeah, and let's get that one. Anyone else want to tell the adults what they're neglecting? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's fine if we, if we don't. All right. I think so, I'll hurt their feelings if I do so. <laughs> Sorry, again? I don't know. Oh, that's fine. We, we, <laughs> that's okay. We got we got one. Um, now, along with the information, social media has given us access to real time current events in a new way. Um, for example, every month we're hearing about a new school shooting. Um, we get crime scene photos and violent footage sent right to our phones into our pockets. So, how do you keep yourself okay in all this? That's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned to do is to give myself space when I need it and to and learn when I need it. Um, and, you know, now that I'm out of last year's funk, I've learned to love my hobbies again and they have become my coping mechanism um, because I used it from what happened last year, and now it's, it's just become something so comforting to me. Um, and I think finding ways to alleviate your negative feelings in a safe environment is so important, because um, then you'll find yourself in, uh, getting into fights or losing people in whatever form that you end up losing them. And it's, it would be better to express yourself in say, for my, for an, as an example, um, I do art, and that way I can, I can beat up my paper with paint and pencil, and I don't end up beating up my family for something that they couldn't control. Anyone else? How do you cope? Um, I know I definitely make sure I also take the time to kind of meditate and reflect on why it hurts me so much or why it affects me so much. And then I go to, you know, somewhere where I feel safe, like at my job at California for Justice. Um, we always have the opportunity to just openly speak about the issues that we feel very strongly about. So I just go there and I, I vent about how I feel. And in that venting, 
I also am granted the opportunity to find a way to bring a solution to it. So I think that being able to not only say how I feel, but also be told, okay, well, this is how you can fix it. This is how you can make some type of change with it so that I don't have to just live with that forever and knowing that this is gonna happen and I'm powerless. Being given that power, I think, is what makes it so much easier to kind of walk with my head held high every day. Oh, you all are so inspirational. <laughs> are, we, are we desensitized? Absolutely. Go ahead. I think in, especially with gun violence in communities of color, man, like, I know that like in Chicago, like there are just, in a lot of communities of color, like we deal with gun violence just as an everyday thing. I know that I live in Oakland, I live in East Oakland and I hear gunshots and that's basically my alarm clock in the morning or my, that's like when I'm told, okay, it's time to go to bed or it's time to stay in the house because they're, the neighbors are doing too much or whatever. And I think that because students of color, youth of color, people of color in general, when they're forced into these low income communities of color, they, feel like, well, I've been dealing with this for 30 plus years, I've been dealing with this for decades, and nobody's done, done anything about it. And now it's time, oh, now we wanna make some change, now we wanna talk about it, now we wanna have a conversation about it, and it's almost discouraging to people who have been sitting there listening to gunshots as babies, having that as their lullabies. And it's like, how do I wake up every day and face a world where my issues aren't important until white tears are shed. So we agree, we're desensitized. What do we do with that? I kind of agree with what um, Cheyenne was saying. We kind of go through this on an um, everyday basis. This is uh, what we experience. It's definitely what I experienced growing up. That's kind of like every time I come home from school, you would hear it and you already knew um, what the sound was, you already knew what it was. Some kids would think it was fireworks, but nah, those are, um, those are gunshots. And I feel like when you got people in power, it's not affecting them, so they don't care. So when they see us fighting or they see gun violence, they're like, oh, it's not happening in my family. Nobody in my family is getting shot or anything. I don't really think they're gonna care for it until we as a people or just us in general say or do something that d directly affects them. It won't be no change if we don't do that. We try different strategies to show them that this is what's going on, this is how we're getting hurt, we need more resources, we need your help. And they are just shaking your head like, no, I'm not. Uh, that's what they've been showing us. We're not gonna give you these resources or anything you need to basically survive because it's a survival. <coughs> I'm age 16, I've been surviving my grandma all the, all the time been there for me ever since I was born. Her and my mom has basically tried to shield me from how the world is. Did, could they do it all the time? Obviously, no, they can't. But they tried their best to make sure I had a good upbringing. I didn't have to experience a lot of things that some of my friends had experienced. And I feel like it has a lot to do with people in power when they don't give us the resources, when they, when they don't plan community events to get some of these communities to come together and sit down and figure out what the problem is. It's, also our fault too, because we need to know as a community, they're not giving us the resources. So obviously we need to come together. And like I said, stop bickering and firing with each other. So yeah, that's all I'd say. And Kier, you've mentioned that your activism is largely influenced by your grandmother. Can you go ahead? Can you tell us about her a little bit? Um, what, what are your memories of her community activism? <clears throat> go ahead and brag. Yeah, <laughs> she's, she's wonderful. My grandma is just, she's my rock. Her and my mom are really my rock. Um, I remember just being young and just seeing all the things that she was doing for the community, um, just seeing her give her last. Like she would sacrifice herself. She would just be crying. I'm like, why are you crying? You know, a little boy with braids in his hair. I'm like, why are you crying, Granny? You know, it's like, I just helped somebody. She just, she's just really, really emotional. She, she's... She gives her last to help out the community. She sacrificed herself to see the bigger picture. 
She's like, she's like a hawk. She visions something big, so she gives her last. She's been a part of multiple organizations. She worked for City of Dreams. She she works now. She's a commissioner. She works at the Dr. David Senior Center. Like my grandma just gives her last. She'll help anybody, even even if they come. Doesn't matter your ethnicity, your background. She has open arms. Even when I feel like, even when I don't see no hope, man, my grandma see hope, and I don't know how. She's very special. She seems special. And and is she here tonight? Yeah, she's right there. Raise your hand, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> And you're from Hunter's View, a neighborhood um, many people in this room may have never been to themselves. Um, what can you describe the Hunter's View that maybe we've heard of versus the Hunter's View that you know? Oh, so the Hunter's View that you guys probably heard of is um, it's a bad place. There's bad people in there. People just die all the time. Drugs, just a bunch of evil. But it's really not like that. If your car was to stop in the neighborhood, people would probably help you. Or, man, my grandma might even help you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Went outside. She, I feel like our community over time, when I was younger, I, I feel like it was really, really bad when I was a little bit younger. But as I got older, the people in the neighborhood that have been through some things started really spreading their arms and saying, like, you don't want to go through the same path as me. So it's a lot of good people in the neighborhood who are wise and have a lot of knowledge to give. Um, a lot of them has graduated college, graduated, graduated high school, have good jobs, and basically they had a good influence on my life because they told me the path that I want to go down, not the path that I want. So, and they also, they just a big influence because the places where you live, the people you see have a big influence on your life. So if you're living in a neighborhood where all they're, where if they promote in, oh, you should go to school, like go to school, do your homework, do this and that, and they own you like if they was like as if they were your parents, then that really makes the child or whoever live in the neighborhood, they're going to blossom, they're going to grow in that neighborhood. And I feel like the organizations that we have there, Omega's Boys Club, I was a part of AIM High, first graduate, uh, my church, Providence Baptist Church, the mayor's office, Hope SF, got Brother, Mal Brother Marquise and Theo Miller right there. They just had a great impact on some of these young males' life. And also some of the, my, like I said, my grandma has had like an impact on many young ladies that I've seen come through there, change their life. Like she's helped them with everything, whether it's getting a job, getting their permit, just helping them out in general. So the neighborhood have good people in there. It's just not all bad or my, or what you guys might think it is, is good people in there who have an impact on youth. And <laughs> <laughs> and when you said one of your main goals um, for your neighborhood is that you want people of all different types, of all different neighborhoods to be able to go to any street in your neighborhood. Um, how do you, this is an audience question, um, how do you get people from different backgrounds to understand your struggles or the struggles of others? So thinking of that, your goal to be able to let anybody go to any neighborhood, any street on your neighborhood, how do you allow them to understand you? Well, uh, for me personally, I think we just gotta explain the history. You can't talk about some if you don't know the history on it. So um, a part of where I work now with Hope SF, I have two people who've lived longer than me who's been around the neighborhood for a while, and that's Brother Malik and Brother Phil. So while I was doing my project with the mayor's office, I basically asked them, like, how, do, how did our neighborhoods become to become the way they did? Like, what had happened? And they basically broke it down to me, and those are elders of our neighborhoods. So I feel like when you have elders telling how our history basically panned out, and that's gonna have, then that's gonna make everybody of all races, black, white, Asian, Puerto Rican, Mexican, it's gonna make everybody kind of understand each other, kind of put yourself in my shoes type of thing. And we're gonna realize that it's not gonna be sympathy, it's gonna be empathy. We're gonna relate with one another. We're not gonna, like I said, we're gonna have a lot more similarities and differences when the communities kind of open up to each other. And that's kind of my dream. I want my younger brother to feel, uh, I want him to feel like it's okay to go to different neighborhoods because sometimes he might want to invite a friend over, but they're not. His parents might let, not let them come to that, come to our neighborhood that we live in, 
And I feel like when you disconnect youth, they're going to grow up, they're going to get older, and they're going to tell their kids that. And then they're going to tell their kids that, and it's going to continue. And it's a cycle of us being disconnected instead of connected. And another audience question, um, going off your point, previous generations have struggled to mend societal divides. What do you believe we need to do differently to do better than past generations? And this one's open to anyone. (laughs) Yeah, we're basically asking you for the future. (laughs) Oh, I think I'll continue. Um, (laughs) Yeah. like I said, like my dream is just, I feel like we need to just p- plan more events. Like we need to have a cultural class, a, an ethnic studies class. Like I feel like in high schools, we need more of those classes to basically understand each other. And I feel like basically for the future, we need more things where you get all communities involved. Anybody can come. You need to have food there. Some people might be hungry, might want to eat some food. So I think you just need to bring more people together. Um, you gotta, you gotta kind of bring something that they all interested in. I feel like uh, youth nowadays, as much as I see a lot of them like basketball, and I, and I have played basketball. And one thing I'm trying to work on right now is getting the gym open for my church. I'll be talking. I talk to like 10, 20 of my friends that are African American, Latino, white. They like, I feel like maybe different places should open up more resources for us or open up the gym for us because I don't really have nowhere else to go. Maybe some of the youth are not comfortable being at home or might not even be allowed to be in their house. They're just on the streets. And when they're on the streets, anything can happen to them. So when you create safe spaces, when you, when you create places like 100% Aim High Make Us Boys Club, for these people, for these girls and men and young men to go into, you provide them with the resources. And and then, and then those certain resources, you gotta make sure they're funded. You gotta make sure that they have everything they need to basically survive, because we need to work together. And if we don't, we just, like I said, we're just going to keep on destroying things. I'm so glad we have you in the mayor's office. Yeah. Now, Cheyenne, in your mental health advocacy, you focus on um, students of color. Why? Um, so in communities of color, we don't really talk about mental health. I know I was lucky enough to be raised by a Puerto Rican mother, um, and she always talk to me about what mental health was, what it means, how it runs in the family, what hers was, what mine was, how to cope with it, how to go every day with it. And I noticed that in growing up and learning that, while I went to school with my peers who were fellow youth of color, a lot of them, I found that I was educating a lot of them about what mental health was. And being an empath, it kind of broke my heart to know that there are people in my own community, not even just thinking worldwide, like just right at home who don't even know that depression and a panic disorder, ADHD, schizophrenia, like those are things that are happening to us in our own minds. And people of color are more likely to suffer from some form of a mental health illness, but they are less likely to ask or receive any type of help. (laughs) Um, And I find that a lot of that has to do with the generational difference in ideologies and values and morals. So I know that in older generations of communities of color, they tend to say, oh, that you're just, you're just sad or you're just tired, you're just hungry. How are you depressed when you have a roof over your head? I, I feed you, why are you depressed? You can't be depressed. And it's like, by doing that, you're forcing this cycle of okay, never speak about your mental health, never speak about your emotions, never open yourself up. And by doing that, it's a generational stop on the conversation. So for me, I find that it's really important for me to, as a youth myself, be that voice for other students of color and also be that teacher for other students who really want to know and who aren't aware of what it is and how significant it is. Now, we're in a room full of adults who want to hear what you have to say. Um, 
what should they know in it, when trying to support young people with mental um, illnesses? Okay, mental health is super tricky. And yes, we can look it up on Google. You can get that big old Mayo Clinic book and you can look at what it means. But at the end of the day, every single person in this room has some form of mental health. And even though we all may have depression or we all may have a panic disorder, my panic disorder is different from your panic disorder. So we have to understand that we are not, yes, we are a whole family, but we are also individuals and we are also our own beings. So when you are talking to a youth of color, you have to give them the space and be open-minded and understanding that they don't know what's going on. They didn't have this education within their, their own schools or even their own homes. They don't understand why when they take a test, their hands shake and their heart races and they start tearing up and they run out of classrooms. They don't understand why when the weather is, is gloomy, they feel like, like dying or they feel like just going under their own covers and giving up for the rest of the day. So you have to understand that when you're having this conversation, you step to them and you say, hey, I'm here with open arms. I just want to hear anything that's on your mind. Talk to me. Have you ever had firsthand experience, um, negative experience in a classroom? Yes. Man. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, you know, growing up, I had, wow. I was always able to talk about my mental health, but it's exhausting to have to constantly be your own advocate every day at school. So when I moved here, I'm originally from New York, so my accent might slip out every now and again. <laughs> so <laughs> if you catch it, just be like, hey, girl, I heard that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was in my, when I moved here, I moved here August 2016, and I moved here my junior year, and yeah, yeah I know you heard that. <laughs> and I was in my math class, and well, even just going into the school, they just kind of threw me in, and they were like, okay, just go to class. They didn't even know that I was brand new to California. I'd never even been to Oakland. Um, there was no welcoming committee. There was no like, oh, hey, this is what you got to do. This is where your classes are. I, so I went to, I found my math class. I went there, I was like 30 minutes late. And I sat in there and you know, it was more than just that first day feeling of anxiety. It was, I feel like everybody here hates me. I feel like I'm by myself because I'm in a brand new place and none of my friends are here, none of my siblings are here, it's just me by myself. So I'm in my classroom and I'm, I'm very bad at math, so I've always had a lot of anxiety with it. And I, was, I remember <sighs> vividly sitting in my classroom and with my panic disorder, I don't really have triggers, so it just happens. So I had a panic attack and I felt the anxiety building up and building up and it was getting harder to breathe and I knew, okay, if I stay in here, it's gonna make it worse. So I ran out of my classroom and you know, I had my panic attack and when I have my panic attacks, it triggers my depression. So when I'm depressed, I can't, I can't fully function. My brain is, is almost like mush. It's, it's exhausting just to even breathe. And I walked back into my classroom and my teacher started scolding me and she was like, where did you go? Why did you run out of the classroom? You shouldn't have done that. And I'm trying to explain to her like, I have anxiety, like having a panic attack, but I can't and <sighs> she's an adult. She's an educator. She is someone I have to respect. I have to look up to. I have to be in a classroom with every single day and to know that she wouldn't even take the time to say, hey, okay, do you need something? You can see like the tears and the, the red on my face and I got some melanin, so if you see the red on my face, you know it's real. <laughs> and it was just so hard to, and, and she was a woman of color. And I think that's what broke me so much that 
I'm supposed to want to look up to you. I'm supposed to want to look at you and say, hey, I'm, I can be just like you one day. You look like me. Uh, this is reflection kind of thing. And I couldn't see myself in her because I know that if I ever saw a student walk in and their face is red and their hands are shaking and they can barely even stand on their own, I wouldn't scold them and, and say, you're bad for, for feeling this. You're bad for not having a better handle on your mental health. I would take them outside of the class and say, hey, what can I do for you? And I feel like by us not doing that, by us not having that conversation and saying, hey, what can I do for you? Instead of what can you do for me? What have you done for me? We're forcing ourselves further and further apart. And it was just, it's a lot for a 16, a 17 year old to just sit there and have to look at an adult and be like, wow, I give up. Wow, so I'm gonna, we're transitioning a bit from that, um, thinking a little bit now about the Never Again movement. Um, that's a movement that is, was created by and for a lot of young people your age. Um, how has that visibility of youth advocacy and youth activism, um, with that being on the rise, how has that impacted your activism? And I'll go ahead and actually ask this question to Caitlin and Gabriel. Um, I think in, in some ways it's been a double-edged sword because I think it's been incredible to see a, a national focus on youth movement and youth voice um, in a way that I think it hasn't been highlighted um, in the past. But I think it also um, has been interesting to watch unfold as well, um, just because of, there are a lot of different intersections that have made the Never Again movement get to where it is now. And I think some of that is um, the demographics of Parkland, Florida, and, um, and that the people who a lot of the times are speaking out and the ones who are getting national attention are students of affluence um, and are lighter skinned students or are white students. And I think... Um, it's it's yeah it's interesting to watch it unfold seeing that students have also and young people have led a lot of other movements too in the past um and that they haven't always gotten credit for it so um movements like black lives matter um and feminist movements and things like that i think a lot of the times young people have been at the forefront um but haven't always had the, haven't always had the space to be listened to in the same way that the Never Again has highlighted. So I think um, it's, it's good and bad, like most things. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I try to look at it in a positive light. I understand that there are not so great things of everything, but I feel like we tend to focus too much on the negative and that is what in the end brings us down because we feel like there's nothing that can be done. So focusing on like the positive is like, it's so cool to see students my age doing something and being listened to because that sort of gives me the hope that I can do something. I can stand up, teach staff at my school, go to the mayor's office, do something big, do something with my life because I see this group my age that look like me doing something that I could do. And I think it's so inspirational that the Never Again movement is you know, causing so much attention. And you know, it just gives so much hope. And I would really hope that you know, things do change for the better. Because um, I'm the future. <laughs> We're the future. That's what this panel is. We're going to be changing things. So, of course, if you don't listen to us, we're going to make you listen, one way or another. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, the Never Again movement saw something a little bit different. Um, those, those Twitter profiles of each of those young people shot right up and um, just the amount of traction they got from Twitter and kind of going to your point, Caitlin, we can do this online. Um, now, this audience question kind of speaks to fake news, which is a hot 
topic uh, nowadays. Um, knowing that you rely so much on the internet for information, how can you tell the truth from what is fake? Um, another part of that question is, um, if, if there's so much fake news, what should we do about it? And this is for anybody. I think because I think now more than ever it's important for education to be focused on um, being literate in identifying news and identifying information um, because I think we have so much technology and so much access to information at our fingertips now that it's less I think education should be less focused on memorizing facts and figures because they're so easily accessible um, and more towards how we can analyze those facts and figures, how we can um, look at them and see like what trends they show or how we can see what is the truth. Because I think a lot of the times the truth can be so um, convoluted um, because there are so many different people who are putting out information and that with the internet it's now more than ever easier to put out information, um, especially um, untrue information. Um, so I think in, in a time of alternative facts, um, it's very important for people to, to know how to identify um, what, what is real and what is not, because thing, things can be very deceiving, especially with the internet now more than ever. So I think um, what's most important, and I, and I think this is true about um, most things, is just that is the, the root is education. Um, and that if we're able to educate young people and future generations to look at the information that they're being given and to see how we can think about these things critically instead of just taking everything for face value. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to the applause after everything you say. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something to add, Cheyenne? Um, well, I think that to kind of go off of what Caitlin said, a lot of our time is spent at school. And I think it's important, and we talk a lot about this at CFJ, is that we talk about the racial injustices and how it ties into school and how like it's important for us to have open and transparent conversations about race mm -hmm. and about you know discrimination, about racism, you know, whatever the issues are, and by allowing your youth of color to talk about it and be real about it, like have a genuine conversation about gentrification, have a genuine conversation about gun control and, and about, you know, even like food stamps, like even things as small as that, it's important for us to understand that in our communities of color, we're going to face things differently. We're gonna face life differently and we're gonna feel things differently. And by having that transparent conversation, you are educating our youth, and our youth is our future generations. And by educating the, that future generation, when they have their little kids, you get, to, you get to have that feeling in your stomach that I educated so-and-so. So I know her kids are gonna know, and their kids are gonna know, and their kids' kids' kids are gonna know, and eventually this cycle of ignorance and this cycle of lack of empathy, lack of sympathy, or not understanding why she feels this way about race or why anybody feels any way will eventually end. Do you ever come across young people who aren't, who just, I'm not really political, or, or choose not to comment on certain things? Um, wh what are your thoughts on those who choose to stay out of the conversations we're having today? Well, I can take this. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <I>? <laughs> um, okay, so working with a lot of youth, I get the luxury of being at CFJ and working with youth who have similar ideals. And then I also go to Oakland High, where even when we had our recent protests for gun control, you know, we talk about, um, I, I saw students of color, they were putting down their fellow students. And they were like, oh, stop chanting, you look silly. Or why are you saying this, you sound dumb. Or why should I, <sighs> I hate this. Why should I go out? What can I make any change? I can't do anything. And I think it has a lot to do with the adults in their lives 
and and how the 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 corruption in in you know <laughs> um, all of the corruption within the, the people that have the political power, and it makes them feel like, well, why should I vote? What's the point? And I feel like by doing that, they're allowing the they're allowing change to never happen. And you know, at the end, I feel like. You talked about earlier how people in power don't care. So we have to become the people in power because we care about these issues. And the only way for us to do that is if we get educated. So if you're in a classroom and you have no choice but to sit there and do that homework assignment about the, the truth behind slavery, the truth behind what this and the third means, then you will understand that, wow, this has everything to do with me. This is me. So by, in, by educating our youth of color, we're empowering our youth of color. And then they become the people in power who will educate those other youth of color, and then we'll continue this generational cycle, man. <laughs> <laughs> Here, how do you think we can best encourage youth activism? That's an audience question as well, um, especially with youth voter turnout. Mm, um, I think, like she talked about, just encouraging them and just basically explaining things step by step. If it takes all night, then it'll take all night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, like I said, you just got to have that connection with them to basically show them the importance of voting how it can change, because I know a lot of youth who don't feel empowered, like, like here, why you go and do what you do? Like, why do you go and help out the community? And why do you stand up, this and that? I'm like, because, bro, we empowered. We have a voice, and we can change things. Me sitting up here, us sitting up here, is saying that we can change things. Us is youth. We have power. We just got to go out and showcase our power. And if people don't want to listen to us, we're going to make them listen. We all smart. Some youth are so smart, even smarter than some adults. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I just, I also feel like that sometimes adults or some people in power kind of push down youth. Some of the youth that don't want to participate in some of these events or the protests or why are you doing that, they've probably been pushed down or probably may feel like that they have no power. Mm -hmm. But once you have friends or you have a group that influences them to show them, like, you can do this, you can go out and vote and change people that are in power so we can have this, so we can have this. So once you get them involved and they see, I can't make a change, then everything is really going to blossom. So that's how I see the power of it. So we've unfortunately reached the point in our program where there's time for one last question. I would love each of you to answer this one. What, you have a full room of audience. You have an online audience. This video will also be um, on, live on the internet forever. What is your, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> What's your message today? We'll go ahead and start with you, Cheyenne. Okay. Um, okay, well, um, all about mental health. So my message for everybody here, everybody who's watching, and everybody who's gonna be watching later on, um, just open your mind and don't allow what wasn't done for you to be the reason why you don't do that for others. Um, I'm gonna just, I'm just go ahead and say that uh, together we are strong, but if we divide it, then you know we weak and we're not gonna get nothing done. So when we have a group of people and we work together, the sky's the limit, and we can accomplish anything. But if we by ourselves, we we just gonna continue to stay divided. So, yeah. I think my biggest advice would be to listen to the youth. Because um, like I said, we're going, and, and not to intimidate you, but we're <laughs> going to replace 
the, the adults because we are youth and we're going to grow. <laughs> so you have to listen to us, whether you like it or not. And I think that's one of the best things that you can do. Listen and learn and accept and understand and work with us. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to remember that one voice or one person, one vote can make such a significant impact, especially because so many people are told that it doesn't matter, and that when every, but when everyone's silent, one person or one voice can make such a big difference. Um, and I think the, a lot of the times, like in feminist spaces, people will say like the future is female, but I think the future is intersectional. The, the future belongs to the young people and the future will be determined by how we choose to move forward and how we choose to use our voices. I hope you're not clapped out because we need to give one final thank you to our panelists. Gabriel Cabrera, yes. transgender LGBTQ plus community activist and almost now senior at Arise High School in Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> Caitlin Clark, teen poetry slam grand champion um, and graduate at Benicia High School. Kier Garrett, Hope SF Phoenix champion and junior at City Arts, now senior? Now senior at City Arts and Tech High School in San Francisco. Yeah. And finally, Cheyenne Gonzalez, youth organizer at Californians for Justice, for Justice um, and freshman at City College of San Francisco. Yeah. This program has been supported by the Bay Area Leads Fund and is part of the San Francisco Foundation series on people, place, and power, addressing access and equity in the Bay Area. We also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. We want to remind everyone that there will be a reception immediately following the program outside this room. I'm Senite Haile Mariam, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.